live. We are international and Rose will be meeting us in a few minutes. I hate to be dependent on the internet, but it, <laughs> there is, there is a, a dependence that is um, real mm. and as they say, palpable. <laughs> mm, especially sometimes <laughs> more than other times. Yeah. On the internet. And um, I just experienced um, enormous sweats and rash and itchy. Mm. No, I, mean, <laughs> <it> was, <laughs> I always, this happens to me. It's been like almost two years that Rose and I have been on and with my other co-host and stuff happens. And she always says to me, don't fight reality. Mm. So I try, I just like mm. accept it, but anyway, we couldn't go live for a few <laughs> minutes and waiting for Rose, but what I will do until Rose gets here is I will, yeah. um, talk slowly. Oh, Rose come soon. <laughs> um, we have to, we have to accept reality, Tova, but we don't no! have to like accepting <laughs> reality at the same time. <laughs> right. It's like, it's exactly here. Rose is Rose, yeah. Rose, Rose. Yeah. yeah. Here it goes. Yeah. I'm now always... the show can go on. We're live. So I'm happy to be here. My name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. It is Monday night. It is Monday morning. It is Monday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And my co-host, Rose Hoy, is here to introduce our guest. Hi, Rose. Good morning. Good morning, Tova. <laughs> this morning, we have the wonderful guest, Matt Javana. Now, Matt is an ISTDP psychologist, and he's going to speak to us about yeah, our attachment to God or our personification, I suppose, of God. All cultures or most cultures that I know of have, have a, a deity, if we call it that. And we're going to sort of talk about how that deity weaves into our lives when we have got um, issues like early attachment problems and how it affects us. Now, I'll hand over to Matt. Please, Matt, give us a little bit of a background of how you became interested in this area and sure. then talk about that attachment to God and how it applies to us and how it applies to people who are suffering in chronic pain. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. I'll do my best. Thank you both for having but me. Real Hello. Quick, so I can deal with my last bit of anxiety. Did I spell your name right? Oh, you nailed it. Okay. You nailed it. That's yeah. Okay. It's not always easy to do with that many letters, but you, okay. you nailed it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you again for having me. Um, hello. Hello to you two. Hello to the audience who's listening. Um, uh, yeah. Very excited to be here. Happy to bring uh, this passion of mine to uh, this audience. Thank you for inviting me and being interested in this topic as well. Um, I recently shared this topic with uh, an ISTDP kind of community of therapists and had just some very interesting responses and feedback. Uh, this is a very underrepresented topic in the world of therapy as a whole, uh, but, but also within ISTDP. Um, so I hope to give some, yeah, helpful information on the topic to help, really to help people feel like they have um, a place to share their spiritual experiences, to be able to share their faith backgrounds. Um, therapy sometimes is a place where uh, your spirituality or your religion is taboo conversation that you're supposed to leave that out in the waiting room when you come into the therapy <laughs> office sometimes. And uh, that's unfortunate because people's spirituality is often the most uh, central and important part of who they yeah. are and, mm -hmm. and what forms their, their ideas about what a good life is. <clears throat> and so, yeah, it would be really unfortunate if we had to leave that outside of the therapy room. Um, but there's actually a lot of research that says that's often what happens. Um, so I want to be inclusive and inviting of people's spiritual backgrounds and help them to be able to think about, yeah, how they can do that in, in the course of their therapy or their personal work. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been a passion of mine for um, throughout my career. Um, so hopefully I can bring some of that information here. Okay. Can you, cool. can you, can you share a little bit about, is there something personal? about why you're you brought because oh, yeah. it's it's you know we all have this in our life on some level but you said i want to incorporate this into my work and into my oh, yeah. therapy and it's just a beautiful oh, yeah. fit 
Yeah, so I grew up with a Christian background. That was my uh, kind of belief system growing up. That's what my family raised me in. And um, I, when I went to college and I was really studying, I was actually a double major, a psychology major and a philosophy and theology major. And I was really like captivated by these visions of life and the world and relationships that the religious pictures and philosophical pictures gave. Um, but they didn't always like, I was looking at my community of like my faith community of people and being like, we're not living the ideals that this whole big picture is like telling us we should live. And why is that? Why, why like, we're all hearing these messages and these sermons about how we're supposed to live, but it's actually harder to do that than just hearing it and going and doing it. Um, so I was really fascinated by that, both with just people I interacted with, with myself, like, okay, I'm trying to live a certain way, but I'm really anxious. Like, I have a really hard time trusting God, even though that's what I'm supposed to do why is that you know and what's going on there and so that's where the science of psychology was always so fascinating to say what makes people tick and what makes people work and what's going on under the surface um, and how do we understand when people's faith isn't just able to be naturally and readily experienced um, so that's that's how i got into it and just kept studying kept studying and that's where i went to fuller theological seminary for my clinical psychology degree Wow. Uh, is to just get more of that integration so that I could help people like myself who were struggling to understand how they fit their faith with their psychological world. Um, so it's been a passion of mine all the way. Beautiful. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Good. Well, you know, Good. one of those things that went, as I was speaking to Matt originally was that sort of like we have a sense of awe. Uh, when mm -hmm. we move into that presence in ourselves. And mm -hmm. and I think that that's what um, we're searching for, is that sort of sense of awe about mm -hmm. our lives. So uh, could you draw yeah. a little bit more on that, Matt? Because when people are in chronic pain, there's no awe going on. Mm -hmm. It's just get up Absolutely. every morning and try to put two feet on the ground and just keep going. Right. And, and that area is just sort of pushed away or Absolutely. drawn in one or the other. And one uh, of the things yeah. you said is that either this idea of God is either compensatory or it's, um, yeah. it adds to our lives. Would you share a little bit Absolutely. about your understanding there? It's sure. So important. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And if at any point going to some of these slides and talking more about them would be helpful, I'm happy to transition. <clears throat> but the, the real thing for me is, okay, how do we experience the fullness of, of what we think a good life is? And, and what then stands in the way of that? And is it chronic pain? Is it anxiety? Is it depression? Uh, what is it that stands in the way of us being our full selves, our best selves? Um, what stands in the way of us being able to experience awe at the beauty of the world or at how we experienced, uh, you know, God's provision over something in our life or whatever it is, whatever our spiritual truths or realities are based on people's background, what's stopping us from being able to fully experience that? And, and that's where this work of ISTDP and the work of therapy has been so compelling to me because it helps you see, oh, these are the barriers, these are the blocks that are really interfering with us experiencing what we maybe know up here to be true, but we're not always feeling it down here. And so how do we kind of put those things together is really, really what ISTDP and what therapy um, has helped me do personally, but also has helped my clients do is is to be able to experience awe when they know they should, but they aren't feeling it because they're crippled in some other kind of way. Um, yeah. So the second thing you mentioned was the correspondence and the compensation. Yes. Right, those different hypotheses. So, um, 
Yeah, I wonder if saying, laying a little bit of more of a framework would help us understand that. Um, what do you think? Should I say a little well, bit more about the background there before we get into oh, that? Or? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Uh, that was my sort of introduction to... Yeah, yeah, to slide into that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. Should we pull up the slides maybe? I'll show a little bit yeah. of the slides and then we can yeah. we can shift oh, into yes. that. Okay, so I'm just going to I'm going to go into the studio and you just I'm going to put up the first slide and leave yeah. you and Rose on to have a little discussion. Okay. And then just tell just tell me say number 1. This is I'm going to bring this up. Okay. I'm going to bring me down and just let me know. Great. Yeah, I'll cue you to to shift forward. So, so yeah, this is, let me say a little bit about some of the background and just tie some of this so we, we can have a foundation upon which to ask some more questions and you and the audience feel free to jump in and, you know, ask clarifications throughout. I'm happy to pause and, and uh, have, have some conversation around it. Um, but really, I'm wanting to give a context for thinking about chronic pain through an ISTDP lens and then wanting to provide a bridge from ISTDP and how we help with chronic pain to then how we understand relationships and then how we understand specifically spiritual relationships or relationship with God or relationship with whatever spiritual deity, like you were saying, Rose, is, is a part of um, your own spiritual or religious tradition. So feel free, um, I'm gonna use the word God sometimes because that's part of my uh, faith background. It's also consistent with some of the research that's out there on attachment to God, um, but feel free to use your own word um, uh, that fits with your own spiritual relationship because um, I'm wanting it to be inclusive to everyone. Um, so when it comes to ISTDP, when it comes to health, when it comes to protecting against chronic pain, it all starts with secure attachment. And this, this is from the very beginning, us as humans uh, attaching to our primary caregivers. Uh, when we get this well, everything goes, goes in line. Uh, it's, it's, it's all um, uh, good when, when this happens well at the beginning. We feel we have a safety, we have security, we have connection. We have a place where we can experience and share our feelings. Um, we have a place where our anxiety can be soothed. Uh, and any kind of mental illness or things that would relate to mental illness or chronic pain get addressed in the, in the context of a secure attachment when all goes well. That's the key thing is when all goes well. <clears throat> so that's what we start with with ISTDP. So go ahead, um, Toba, you can advance the, to the next slide here. Because the thing is, is that it doesn't always go well. And in fact, more often than not, it doesn't go well. And then things start to happen that then lead us away from this path and lead us towards uh, difficulties that then leave us predisposed to mental illness, predisposed to symptoms, predisposed to pain. So um, when, when secure attachment is harmed, so for example, if somebody doesn't respond to you in a secure way, they could either overtly harm you uh, in context of abuse or something like that, or they could just consistently be unresponsive to your emotional needs that we sometimes talk about that as attachment trauma or um, attachment ruptures. But what, what, what happens then is there's a number of pathways that this then leads to chronic pain. So one is it leads to painful and conflicted feelings. So if we have a caregiver who lost it on us and physically abused us, we're gonna have a big emotional reaction to that. We might have emotional pain. We might have rage. We might have guilt about feeling rage towards somebody that we love also. We might have grief. <clears throat> so we have all these very intense feelings that get activated. But now the safe person that we're supposed to share those feelings with was just the one who abused us. 
okay, so now we're in a bit of a pickle. So what do we do about all these emotions <clears throat> that now are, are um, not able to be freely expressed because our caregiver now is our abuser as well? Uh, that's where anxiety starts to come in. And this can lead to additional loading of physical pain. So um, you've had ISTDP speakers on before. They've talked about the pathways of anxiety in the body. Um, those primarily take the form of striated muscles, smooth muscles, or cognitive perceptual disruption. So it's a mouthful, but what, what that means is that, that anxiety about feelings can get channeled into the body uh, through our nervous system in different ways. So the striated muscles is like tension-related muscles. Uh, these are voluntary muscles. So you can get pain uh, like back pain, tension headaches, fibromyalgia, um, various symptoms associated with just chronic tension in muscles. That can be one way that pain occurs. Um, you can get smooth muscle associated pain, which is typically in the stomach or the GI or bowels. Um, you can get irritable bowel syndrome. You can get uh, ulcerative colitis. You can get other um, gut related difficulties associated with anxiety. Um, cognitive perceptual disruption is when people get dizzy or faint or blurry vision or ringing in their ears. Um, I have a local uh, ear, nose, and throat doctor who refers me people because she has people who have ring in their ears. She does a physical exam and everything's fine. And then she knows, okay, it must be anxiety related and so sends them over to me. Um, but really this anxiety is caused by just people being anxious about their feelings when they don't have a safe caregiver to share those feelings with. And in the context of attachment, trauma, and abuse, this, this can really... Um, come up very habitually. You can think of somebody who is sad, but every time they're sad, their parents say, I'll give you something to cry about, or big boys don't cry, or you shouldn't be crying over that, or whatever it is, it's really going to start to make a person anxious whenever they have feelings that their caregiver is not okay with them feeling. So you can think in your own life or your own family growing up, what are the emotions that I could more readily feel and share? And what are the emotions that were difficult for me? Right. Uh, Very well explained. Rose, did you want to comment on anything before we conti continue on? Did you want to make a comment? Well, thanks, Matt. It's yeah. been really... <laughs> it's, re it's really beautiful to explain. I remember hearing this when I first met Rose, and I was just like, whoa, this is... It all makes... So it's always amazing, but it just, it's a, it, it, I didn't put the pieces together. And then I think some of the, the yeah. clients that Rose and I have seen, that she's seen, they, they really, it's, 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 it just makes such perfect sense. Yeah. The body and the mind. Really, Absolutely. Really. Absolutely. Yeah. And how then when these things get, get um, triggered in the body, that it can really, um, these all can happen on an unconscious level. And so we don't even realize they're happening. We don't even realize that we're in pain sometimes, or sometimes we do, but we don't realize when our body's tightening up or having these different kind of reactions. So it makes it very difficult to then understand where this is coming from. Yeah. Right. And, and the, the emotional pain becomes uh, visible, doesn't it? In the body. And, and, you know, if, if you just sort of, bring back that old story how it actually happens in the present moment because that's what happens that we meet a new person or we're falling in love and all of a sudden we don't know how to handle it and it could well yep. be from an attachment trauma could you sort of share a little bit about absolutely. that absolutely Yes, yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So these unprocessed feelings <clears throat> that get kind of stuck or um, unprocessed in the body, they really get and, and you can think about it as just stored in the body. Uh, I mean, this is the um, Bessel van, van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, that's, mm -hmm. you know, reached so much popularity is literally that, that, that these unprocessed memories and emotions get stuck in the body. And that then um, they, they get triggered when you interact in different relationships or you experience things in your life. 
you might be, yeah, in a new relationship and all of a sudden your body starts to hurt again or you start having symptoms that you didn't have for a while. And it's just because this new relationship is activating these unprocessed feelings associated with past losses, past traumas, past ruptures. Mm. Yeah. Could we now join that to the God yeah. relationship? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So part of ISTDP is that we're understanding commonalities and patterns across relationships. So we're seeing how, okay, the relationship in the present links to relationships in the past. And your attachment patterns in the present are mirroring your attachment patterns in the past, which just means your ways of relating around your emotions and around connection. So then as an ISTDB therapist, you're also seeing how is the patient relating to me and how are they handling their feelings in relation to me? So that's what we talk about in terms of the triangle of person is how people relate to the therapist, how people relate to their current relationships, and how that ties back to the past. Now, what do we do about spiritual relationships? And how does that fit in? <clears throat> and this was really my question because I had a lot of patients coming in and talking about their relationship with God because that's part of why they were seeking me out as a therapist specifically. And they said, well, what do I do with I don't feel connected to God or I feel that God is judging me or I feel that I'm depressed every time I try to pray or something like that. And mm -hmm. I said, OK, uh, well, how do I work with that? How do I help somebody with that? <clears throat> and so I wondered, well, does these same patterns that we see with anxiety and responses and different things and other relationships, do those start to show up in the same way in people's relationship with God? And so I started to ask people, well, uh, how do you feel towards God? Because <clears throat> this is what I would ask about other relationships in light of my ISTDP training. Well, what do you feel about God? How do you feel towards God? <clears throat> and I started to notice that people would respond in the same exact ways, same kind of anxiety, same kind of emotions, same kind of um, defenses or avoidant patterns when they were talking about their feelings with God as they were in other relationships. So I said, this is very interesting because God is supposed to be something different or whatever. And yet fundamentally, people's spiritual relationships are an attachment relationship. So and this is, this is what the literature on attachment to God has demonstrated very clearly is that um, for example, if you look at when people pray and you put them in a brain scanner, <clears throat> it's the social communication part of the brain that's going off. So it's literally like someone's having a conversation with somebody, even though they're praying to God or praying towards some deity or something like that. And so I thought, well, wouldn't it just make sense if people started having the same kind of attachment patterns with their spiritual relationships as they do with these other relationships? And I was really shocked to see how, how identical people's responses often were. And that's this whole thing that you asked earlier, uh, Rose, about the um, compensation or the, the yeah. correspondence hypothesis. Yes. And that basically says that, yeah, you're going to experience God in the same way that you experienced your attachment figures. So if you got abused as a kid by a primary caregiver, you're going to experience God as abusive, right? Wow. Or if you had to hide your feelings from your caregiver because they didn't want to hear them, you're going to have to hide your feelings with God. <clears throat> and there's all these just natural patterns that get played out because it's an attachment relationship and it activates the same attachment system that we have inside wow. of us. One of the fascinating things I found reading reading your, your article was yeah. that the compensatory part just i found yeah. that very lovely very beautiful that yeah. we can find in our spiritual lives a space for that yeah. for well you called it the corner of a triangle missing and that people can actually find a spiritual relationship that fills that corner would yeah. you embrace that a bit more for us so Absolutely. our viewers can actually get an idea 
of how they can lean in to God in a way, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. And, and fill that corner that's been broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was the, the, and this goes to the compensatory hypothesis that's in, in the literature that you were asking about earlier as well. Mm. And, and that's this really interesting finding in, in that um, there's, a, it, it's a literature that's gone back to the 80s is people studying, social psychologists studying people's experiences of God. And what they find is either typically it corresponds with their ex attachment experiences with their caregivers, but then they find that sometimes there's a compensation or a compensatory effect. And, and what they found is that if there's a context of abuse, but they have a attachment to some spiritual um, personification or some, some spiritual relationship, mm -hmm. that that can serve as a protective effect. Mm. Just, <clears throat> just like if, you know, you have abusive parents, but you have a kind grandmother who looked mm -hmm. after you and asked you how you were doing and you know, told you it was going to be okay and supported you, that's like a massive protective effect than if all you had is an abusive context. And so in the same way that people's spiritual relationships can provide a protective effect in the context of attachment trauma or, or abuse. Mm -hmm. And so they say, well, everybody out there, nobody's safe. <clears throat> Everybody's trying to hurt me. Right. But but that's what's so meaningful to me is that there's a God who I know who is safe and who is there for me right. in a way that no one else is. Right. So their relationships can just be trauma after trauma after trauma, mm -hmm. and yet somehow they can experience some mm -hmm. compensatory thing with, with God. Well, you know, that is, it's like I'm sure there's a lot of studies about this, which is a little bit off the topic, but so many people, so many people left the Holocaust and lost their faith in God and yeah. then many people got their faith in God. And I think mm. it's a it's a personal thing of which person Absolutely. decided to. And I, I also just want to, to piggyback that and say that a number of guests that Rose and I have interviewed in the last two years and, and on my uh, Israeli show, the same, um, there's, some, there's a pattern. Number one, they took people that healed from autoimmune disease and cancer and chronic pain one of the things, of course, is they took responsibility for their health and their life. Mm -hmm. but another thing that many of them did was they had enormous belief in God. Or they accepted Jesus in their life or they, mm -hmm. they got close to the Torah. I mean, and this, yeah. this served a purpose. So I think that's what it served a purpose and a meaning that yeah. gave them a, a will to live. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So yeah. I, so there's so this is absolutely there's a bunch of research that shows that because this is again part of what supports this stuff is there's research that um, resilience for example or or mental fortitude or um, your ability to withstand traumas or stressors uh, is better if you have a secure um, spiritual relationship. Wow. Wow. That you have a way of making sense of the world, of making sense of these difficulties, <clears throat> and it and it again serves as a protective uh, effect. But that's only if you have a secure relationship <clears throat> with with your with God or with whatever your spiritual relationship is. If it's insecure, if it's riddled with anxiety or avoidance strategies, if you don't feel you can be safe and share your feelings. Now, it's that you don't have good mental health out outcomes. You don't have less chronic pain. You actually have more because now not only are you being traumatized in some way, you experience that as a way God's persecuting you or trying to punish you for the things that you did in the past or whatever it is. So it really comes back to do you have a secure attachment in your spiritual relationship? Or is it somehow just a reflection of these past abuses or traumas that you've been through? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I always, for people that are, have a spiritual background, I always suggest they read the Psalms and read the second half. Mm. Not just the good bits, but yeah. read the whole lot. Yeah. And sort of, yeah. Absolutely. God on your side and yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and then it's, yeah. A, and it's a very important, I mean, Rose is, 
it's very important that we you know we have this knowledge we know you know we have this connection to god and then some people it will stay up here and they won't know how to apply it. it into That's their it. so maybe you can show us how do we yeah. take that connection and then implement it into my stressful day and make my day less stressful yeah read the psalms and you can well, really? do, I, do i write them over 10 20 times do mm -hmm. i like i have to own you know i have to own them i have to yeah i have to be, act like i mean i it's something deeper so this is where people get stuck so yeah. unstuck us unstuck us right sure. now <laughs> let's talk and and then we i can show we can pull up the last slide maybe two oh, of, my, of those ones that i sent you because it has some tips that would really beautiful. answer your question there yeah. but so <clears throat> this is so there's there's this really interesting thing called a god god image versus god concept and this is another thing that's in this literature mm. <clears throat> and it's it's you have this concept of god which goes along with your thoughts about god or your thoughts about a deity or your thoughts about how this spiritual reality is but then you have an experience of it which is this god image and this is more your emotional response your relational experience and these are different things. They don't always line up. In fact, often they don't because one is based on your experience. One is based on like teaching or intellectual study or something like that. <clears throat> so what's fascinating is when you start to see these differences and that's where the Psalms can be so helpful is you read certain Psalms of expression of emotion towards God and people start to get very uneasy. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, "Wait a minute, are you allowed to say this?" I mean, you they know? were, they were, and those those psalms are intense. They're oh, full. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Depth of emotion. The, the lament psalms and different <laughs> yeah. things. I mean, there's there's nothing that makes. Uh, you know, I've talked to pastors about this and said, "Hey, why don't why aren't we reading some of these psalms? Why is why isn't there a place for people's lament and their struggle? Why is?" Why does church have to be a place where everybody's just putting on a happy face, you know, and saying everything's good? What do we do with all of our pain and our grief and our anger and our rage? And where does that go? You know, and because the lament psalms are there. I mean, they they bring that in. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. like a part of their part of like the worship was just saying, mm -hmm. hey, God, you've thrown me into a pit. You've cast me out. What are you doing? You know, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And so that's where it's like it's modeled in a lot of spiritual traditions is this authentic expression of faith. And that's really secure attachment in my mind is like, yeah, no, like God can take it, you know, like God doesn't need our defenses and our silence and our like emotional suppression. It's just we can bring our whole selves. And yeah, maybe our caregivers couldn't, but you know, if, if there's any spiritual reality worth believing in, it's like they can they they can take our heat, you know. And yeah. so why aren't we bringing it? And that's where, you know, going through things and encouraging people to share their honest feelings has been a big, big help for a lot of people. And actually a big way you can help yourself with pain. You know, if, if you're having pain and you're stuck and you're tight and you're going through difficulties, sometimes just saying, hey, God, this is what I'm feeling and sharing whatever your honest feelings and authentic reactions mm -hmm. are can be mm -hmm. a huge way to get a release of some of the feelings that you have. Beautiful. So true. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. true. You know, it's like neurologically, the research is that when we write things down or say things out loud in the mirror or pray, yeah. something neurological changes, something yeah. shifts. Yeah. So yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah. But there's there's there can be there can start to be just like there's socially acceptable um, like defenses that people use or avoidance strategies like you don't talk about this or you don't talk about that or whatever it is. There can be religious um, uh, norms that support certain defenses like, you know, yeah. Uh, and these are sometimes called spiritual defenses or sometimes called spiritual bypassing, but there are ways in which you take these religious concepts, but they get kind of adopted by defenses. And then you start using them in a defensive way, even though you think you're just doing whatever the religious right Can answer you give is. Can give us an example? Totally. <clears throat> so like one thing that people say is like, well, everything happens for a reason or 
oh, God must be doing something through this or whatever it is. Now, that might be true, and that might be consistent with your faith experience, that God's in control and that, you know, all this is happening for a reason. That could be true. And if someone's starting to ask you about the feelings that you have about something traumatic that you went through, that might also be a way where you give a spiritual answer, but you're also dismissing or avoiding what you truly feel about the trauma that you're going through. You know, so that's... I think you've got a, have you got yeah. a slide on that? You've got uh, a slide on that, I think. Not, not in the ones that I sent you. Oh, uh, what a shame. In, in the other <laughs> talk, but we can send that YouTube. Uh, I've got a recording of that that we can share as well. But it's, yeah. things, it things, it's things like everything happens for a reason. It's in God's hands now. Um, <clears throat> uh, just ways of dismissing the, the, the authentic feelings that somebody has in response to their difficulties. Yeah. And it has a like spiritual connotation to it that sounds like, ooh, this is the thing maybe you're supposed to say in church or, you know, or something like that. But it's, but it's veiled when you listen to kind of the, the meaning underneath. It's, it's a way of dismissing their emotions. Could you expand on that in the, in the context of grief? Because I think the, oh, the way yeah. you expressed that was just so lovely. And I, yeah. I think our audience would appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite things that is, has been a part of my family's tradition, this is, this is what my mom used to say to me, this is what my Grammy used to say to my dad, and it's from scripture, it's, it's, it's this too shall pass, is this phrase. And so when somebody's really struggling or suffering or grieving, it, it's this kind of this too shall pass, which is this beautiful reminder that your grief isn't forever you know, and that there is more to life than just your grief. And there's a beauty and goodness beyond your grief. So on one hand, I love that. And on another hand, <clears throat> you're not really joining the person in their grief. That's right. <laughs> right? You're kind you're not, of saying, you're not hey, get over it. They're not, not getting validated. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They're trying to bring their grief to you. And you're saying, well, your grief's going to go away. Right. Okay, That's thank right. you. But what uh, about the my, grief? My I'm mother always right said now? it to me. My mother always said it to me. Yeah, I have a very conflicted relationship with stuff like that because I <laughs> there's it, there's something beautiful about the vision, you know, of like yes, that's true. There's a bigger reality, you know, beyond just my temporary suffering and all that kind of stuff. But but on an emotional level, and when you're looking through the lens of attachment and emotion processing and all that kind of stuff, it's like. You know, yeah. How can we encourage about the spiritual reality while also joining people in their grief? You know, while also having secure attachment. That's that's really where these two come together. Then then it's just beautiful across all levels, as opposed to using a beautiful spiritual picture to dismiss a psychological reality. Yes, yeah. I think this revolution. There's a revolution going on today in the world with healers and health professionals, and you know, like I told you, what Dr. David Specter Specter said about. I even keep it here about guilt. Guilt is an inner signal of your innate goodness. Oh yeah, and like yeah. so here I'm saying we, you know, and I remember going to synagogue and saying, well, these these people are not role models for us. How do we? Mm. My rabbi said, well, we learn from them. And I'm thinking we could rewrite the scriptures and we could mm. validate and say, this too shall pass. And I know you're in pain and, and, I, and let's yeah, talk about yeah, it. Yeah. So yeah. what we could do is we could, we are in the spiritual revolution of, because yeah. the things that we're reading and, and the things that we, we see online and the beautiful books and the beautiful, the poetry from, from Sunita and all mm -hmm. is giving us hope, and it's, so it's and it's completing that. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Rose? It's sort of completing that, but like, mm -hmm. are we ready yeah. for that revolution? Because yeah. I think we're in it. I think we're in it. Like we want flower power, Tova. Right, we flower power. We want more. We want more. It's not enough. We want 
we want more. We want solutions. And yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Our generation's about solutions. That's just what came well, into my head. Yeah, I'm yeah. Thinking of Woodstock or something. Are you talking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. here's here's my thing, because for because some of it might be yeah, re rewriting or reinterpreting certain scriptures. For for me, it's like usually there there is truth across the scriptures you know, whatever the spiritual tradition is, there's beauty and there's oh, truth absolutely. in it. <clears throat> the yeah. problem is, is how humans apply and interpret that to the people that they're around and how that gets filtered through their own defenses or religious defenses or whatever that is, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that, that there might be passages that say this too shall pass, but there's also lament Psalms, which model like authentic expression of suffering, you know? And so I think it's just, well, when are you highlighting what scriptures, you know, and how are you bringing that to, to, to your friends, to your family, to your community in an emotionally sensitive way? And what are you highlighting? Are you, is somebody bringing grief and you're bringing scriptures that tell them they shouldn't feel what they're feeling? Okay, then you're, bring, you're, you're just being a, you know, you're, you're being run by your defenses as opposed to really bring in the full truth of scripture and how they can meet a person, you know, in the midst of their suffering and in the midst of their pain. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, said, that's, oh, I love the Psalms. Well said. You know, yeah. Yeah. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord, you yeah. know, uh, exactly. Yeah. The depths of my suffering. Yeah. 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 I, I, uh, I was invited to talk. We, we had a, you know, again, this is my tradition, but, um, I, I was invited to give a talk on a on Good Friday, which is you know the the day that you focus on Christ cru is crucifixion, <clears throat> and we were supposed to give this little talk on these different messages of like last things Jesus said on the cross, and mine was my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <clears throat> and yeah. I thought, okay, this is how perfect that this is this is Jesus modeling authentic expression of feelings towards God on the cross. It's, it's a way of modeling, you've forsaken me. What, like, why are you doing this? You know, it's- he's really, He was really expressing his true feelings. He wasn't exactly. hiding. Exactly, oh, wow. and, and, and it's, it's a way that, okay, yeah, this, this isn't, oh, well, I'm on the cross, but everything happens for a reason, you know, or, oh, well, God. this too shall pass. It's terrible, you know? it, it's, it's terrible. No. It's this is this is what it means to be a part of my full experience and part of the fullness of spiritual reality is okay, an authentic expression of our real feelings about what we're going through. You yeah. know, so that people was should read a, people yeah. should read that full psalm. Because yeah. that's another yeah. psalm. Ex exactly. Yep. Yes. Exactly. And that's what's so important about if we've got a relationship yeah. with a spiritual being. To yep. actually have a full relationship with right. that spiritual being. That's it. If well, you need to be right. angry, you need right. to be angry. If I mean, you need Moses, to be sad. Moses, you need right. to be Moses sad. defied God. Moses said, No, I'm not doing it. I'm not going. Exactly. In. I cannot do it. I'm not strong enough. I'm, he's, and God exactly. is like, Yes, 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 I'll be there with you. And then he's just like, All right, show me the way. So he wasn't yeah. trying to please God. He was like, I'm out of here. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's that's where it's like, man. Well, how how are we how are we encouraging? I mean, this is what I this is a you know again a big passion for why I do what I do is how do we encourage that? And then and then from an ISTDP lens, how are we helping people see when they're not feeling the freedom to do that? You know, so I'll ask somebody, well, you know, okay, God was supposed to. They'll be talking. God was supposed to protect me. You know, I know God has everything under control, but why did I get into this car accident? It's like God abandoned me and all this stuff. And okay, how, so how are you feeling towards God if that's how you see it? You know, right. well, I'm sure it happened for a reason, you know. Okay, uh, but you were just saying that, yeah, it felt like God abandoned you. How, how do you feel towards God about that? Well, I just, I guess I shouldn't have been driving on the road that day, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and and it's like, Okay, so we're seeing that there's just these really automatic ways in which people avoid their feelings. And then wow. it's, 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 wow, that's showing up in people's relationship with God too. And it's the same way that they responded. You know, sometimes patients will say the same exact phrase. 
I was asking them about feelings with me and I was asking about feelings with God, both in the same session. And they said the same thing. They said, I'm angry, but I, I know I shouldn't be. In the same exact way, in three different occasions over the course of the session. And it was like these automatic just defenses that show up that just kind of hamper a person from their authentic expression of honesty about their feelings, you know, and it happens with people and it happens with spiritual relationships too. Wow. It does. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. profound. So profound. So yes. do you want to pull up that last yeah. slide and I'll just go through those little yeah. pieces of tips and suggestions yeah. and yeah, just yeah. to make it practical, leave some, really, leave, leave right. with some tips. And then yeah, if and you then, have questions then, or examples from the audience that you want us uh, to engage with more or examples of your own experience of this stuff, feel free to throw it in and we'd happy, be happy to comment on it. So this is the kind of encouragement in the end or the tips if you're somebody who has a spiritual experience or background, um, uh, which the research out there says that about 80 to 90 plus percent of the world has some kind of relationship with some divinity or some kind of belief in God or something like that. So if, if, if that's you or if that's part of your experience, um, in light of what we've been talking about, these are some tips that you can take with you um, that, that, that should have, have a direct benefit in terms of your uh, pain. Um, that it's the same kind of process that helps a person in, you know, working with therapy or working in their experience with their mother or their father or their therapist, that the same thing can happen in your spiritual relationship, even if you don't have access to a therapist or, or somebody who's, who's there to listen with you. But the key things are to be able to share your feelings honestly and openly, to be able to say, like, just let it all hang out. <clears throat> um, I heard heard this one uh, talk recently that said, bring your bad theology to God, <clears throat> which was basically like, I know this doesn't make sense theologically. I know this doesn't fit the picture of my religion or whatever, but I don't care. It's how I'm feeling. I'm just going to bring it. <clears throat> and so they brought that in prayer or brought that in meditation of this is how I'm feeling. I felt abandoned. I'm angry. I'm sad. <clears throat> God, how could you do this? Where were you? <clears throat> All those kinds of expressions are really, really um, key to a secure relationship. And that if you can do that, often you'll get a release of feelings. You'll feel better. You'll feel heard. You'll feel like you got something off your chest. And that's that much more emotion that doesn't have to create more anxiety or more blockages uh, in the body. So share honest feelings. Look for spiritual defenses. If you're in therapy, you can look for the same defenses that your therapist points out in your relationship with, with um, your God or your whoever your spiritual connection is with. So are you avoiding sharing your honest feelings? If you say, God, I'm angry at you, do you get anxious or pain in your body? Is that forbidden for some kind of reason? Is that forbidden in your faith tradition? Um, so, you know, obviously stay congruent with your faith tradition and, and stick with what's most important to you, but look for some of those inconsistencies. Um, compare some of your spiritual relationships to other attachment relationships. So say if, man, if I'm having a hard time opening up with my therapist or with my partner or whatever, could it be that I have a hard time opening up with God? Are these similar kind of patterns that I bring into my spiritual relationships that I bring into other relationships? And that sometimes helps cue you into what might be happening in your spiritual relationship as well. Um, and finally, bring your spiritual relationship patterns into therapy. This is not, uh, it's not taboo. Uh, it's not off limits that your spirituality is part of your cultural, uh, your, your cultural uniqueness. It's part of an issue of cultural diversity. It's part of what makes people who they are and, and the core of who they are. And so bring it into your work in therapy, share it uh, with your therapist, um, talk about it, process it, look at your feelings and your spiritual relationships. Um, that's a, a key way in which you can continue to get this stuff out. Well said, Tim. I just wanted to let people know that these slides, there's a few more. Um, I'm going to post them in the morning on the yeah. fa our Facebook, that they're just marvelous and so well mm. done. So if Good. anyone has any questions about that, I'll be posting that and I can send you, uh, there's 12 of them, a wonderful yeah. program. Can you put Robbie's um, 
comments up. Yes. Although will it fit? Yeah. I don't know. Yes, I think it will. I will put Robbie's yeah. comment up. Hmm. So can you see the whole thing? Yeah, I Just can see the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. You want to read it out loud? Can you read it out loud? Sure. For us? Yeah. Thank you, Robbie, for, for your response. I want, it's Robbie saying, a wonderful, incisive session and perfect timing. It makes total sense for me having had no attachment. And even though I had a born again experience, these emotions weren't healed and I drifted away and lost my faith. I'm finding since I started my ISTDP journey that God has become a brand new relationship that isn't compensatory, but one that is becoming profoundly healing. Uh, and I'm just starting to feel the awe in life. Love listening to this. Thank you. Nice. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So beautiful, Robbie. Yeah. Here's so another uh, another woman's asking a questions. Mm -hmm. So some spiritual traditions are trying to model how we should think, feel, and believe. How can we manage the disempowerment? Isn't putting your life in God's hands potentially dangerous? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's always uh, questionable to me, given that secure attachment is so essential, whenever spiritual or religious teaching goes against what secure attachment is, that's, that's where I think we have a right to ask questions about that and say, okay, is religion being used as a way to tell me I shouldn't be feeling what, what I'm feeling? Is religion being used to tell me I shouldn't have safe safety and security in my relationships? And that's that's where we can start to ask, well, is this really truth? Or is it that this is a distortion in some way of, of some spiritual reality? Because I think across religious and spiritual traditions, there's an emphasis on safety and security and trust and peace and all these things. And if and if it's counter to that, then we're right to ask questions yes yeah wow. and yeah. often it's the person who's actually <clears throat> sharing that religious background that's got their own problems their own issues that they needed to resolve before they were giving other people uh options or, or exactly instructions yeah. i suppose is the right word yeah exactly this is the this is the terrible you know findings and research and occurrences of pastoral abuse and um, situations in which people have been abusive from a position of religious power. So mm -hmm. it's a reality. It happens. Uh, people use their spiritual power or their authority religiously um, at times to take advantage or they use it for their own purposes. Um, we're all humans. We all have flaws. We all have defenses. We all have issues and and just being spiritual alone won't won't heal that won't take care of that and so there's sick people in across spiritual traditions uh, and we need to be aware of how spiritual truths are being used for maybe somebody's own purposes not to say to distrust your elders or distrust your spiritual leaders um, but that we're all human um, and to just kind of take take those teachings um, yeah with that in mind you know, Matt, could I just uh, draw a little bit more about that? That when we actually put our spiritual leaders or whatever on a pedestal, um, it makes it very difficult. Could you actually embrace yeah. that a little bit in regards to attachment and to ISTDP? Yeah. Because putting people on a pedestal, uh, we end up then knocking them off the pedestal. So we've got this... Yep. Um, compliance, defiance type of... Idealization, factor. compliance, defiance, absolutely. Yes. Could you so these, explore that a little bit more? Because I think it's important for people in chronic pain. Yeah, absolutely. So, so with secure attachment, safety, honesty, openness with an equal other who has your interest in mind and you have their interest in mind, that's the ideal, that's the goal. Now, what happens when one person is the ideal and then you're the lesser one? Okay, now they're telling me what I should think and what I should feel. Okay, they're the good one, I'm the bad one. Okay, are we equals who are able to share our feelings and experiences with each other? Or does it start to become hierarchical in some kind of problematic way? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's, that's where you can start to idealize a person 
And then if you're idealizing a person, then two of the relational patterns that can go along with that are first some kind of compliance. <clears throat> so I'm just going to go along with whatever they say, right? Or defiance, I'm going to go against what they say, or I'm now they're going to be the bad one or, you know, or something like that. And that really interrupts just security, openness, honesty, mm -hmm. when we're having to just comply with whatever some other authority mm -hmm. is telling us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's akin to a family where you can't speak up against one of the parents. Mm -hmm. And you have to just say whatever the parent wants you to say. Is that secure attachment? Honestly sharing your feelings about what's going on and having somebody hear you and understand you and collaborate with you? Absolutely not. It becomes something distorted, some insecure attachment that then can suppress people's feelings, internalize people's feelings, and contribute to chronic pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes so much sense. Yeah. Thanks, um, Matt. Th this yeah. is lovely. Uh, yeah. You know, if, if I could just mention as a, as a background, yeah. if, you know, when people say it's in God's hands, it actually sets a, them up to be a victim, doesn't it? Whereas mm. if they can say, I'm under God's umbrella, mm. God's there with you, in your suffering, mm. Not, mm. not challenging you about your suffering, but they're holding your hand or yeah. being present to you rather yeah. than having it that it's a good or a bad situation because suffering is it, it's an internal thing that we all experience to a certain extent. Yeah. And putting it outside as as this deity being in charge yeah. and punishing us. You know, um, I'm always called to mind about Viktor Frankl being in the concentration camp, Absolutely. but knowing that every day he recognised the suffering around him and he noticed that the people that died were the ones that gave up. Mm. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think it's sort of important, you know, I mean, the name of the book is Man's Search for Meaning. Anyone out yep. there who no, really wants to powerful, very the, powerful. Book. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, yeah, that it's it's a kind of passivity is what it can encourage. Oh, it's in God's hands. Yeah. <clears throat> and so it's a way of saying I'm passive. I can't do anything. I, I don't have a right to have any feelings about it. It can be. Um, so that's where I would say, oh yeah, it is okay. It's in God's hands. And how do you feel about it? You know, and yeah, and what's it like as you imagine God there with you in the midst of your suffering? And how do you imagine that? And how do you feel as you imagine that? These are some of the ways where you can encourage a, a person's active experience of what that is, as opposed to just dismissing, yeah. you know, yeah, some of these other things. You know, I'm sure it's just, it's another whole show, um, but there's religion, you know, and there's spirit. And yeah. the beautiful part of the mind and body, which rose in, you know, the mind, body, mind, body. Well, you know, the spirit is this, is this third part of the intimate right. relationship that we each have our own experience with. And for some, you know, some people in my, in my world here in Israel, they feel that like cancer is a cry of the soul. That's what they call it, wow. you know. So there's an enormous amount of um, spiritual healing going on. Of course, mm. it's another whole. It's and sometimes it's just words, and then so God's not in the picture, but that there's this spiritual. Like we're born perfect. Mm. That's our spirit. Like what is the yeah, spirit? Yeah, yeah. Is the spirit yeah. in the cell? Is the spirit in the in the? You know, like it's fascinating information. And um, yeah. Like what part of the body is spirit? What do you think Dr. Davenu would say about spirit? Mm. Nothing. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I you know, I asked when I gave my talk on, hey, why haven't people addressed spirituality in ISTDP before? Uh -huh. And and people said, Well, because Davenu didn't. Davenu <laughs> didn't talk about it. And so all of us Davenu disciples, <laughs> we weren't gonna talk about it if Davenu right. wasn't gonna talk right. about it. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. you know, yeah. it's definitely, um, look, there's, we, we live in a world where there's extremes and polarizations and, you know, God has been so abused and so misused and so misunderstood mm. oh, yeah. that we're, we're down to like that, um, 
you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's been sad, but you, you brought you tonight, yeah. you talked about just a beautiful way to incorporate spirit or God or vision and just beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. What's yeah. coming to mind as you say that is just this sense of like, are you, are you at your core a good, like good? You know, and that your your feelings are okay, and they make sense, and they're acceptable, and they're understandable. You know, and that's really like, can you feel that in your soul in a way that you're okay, and that you're good, and that you're accepted, and that you're loved, and that your emotions make sense, and they're understandable, and people will accept you and receive you, yeah. even when you're having your feelings. You know, yeah. like that's the core of it for me. And yeah. and does your does your spiritual tradition help you with that? Does that encourage that? Or, or is it somehow working against that or telling you you're bad or that something's wrong with you or you're flawed? Or, you know, so that's where these things really come together, I think, across spiritual traditions, across therapy and spirituality and all these things come together. It's just this essence of can we all find commonality that there's goodness inside of us and that we're acceptable, loved human beings that can share in that together? You know, that's that's what really. That's another session. Mm. That's just. That's yeah. another session. Next yeah. time we'll just dive deep into that because that's <laughs> worth it. So now we get, now we have to have you back. <laughs> yeah. So that, thank you for your time. Yeah. It's just been oh, wonderful. Oh, this has been great. Could could yeah. we just have a quick look, Tova, at that first introductory thing, and it shows God in the in the um, in the brain. Michelangelo's yeah. painting in the city oh, yeah, yeah. shows the brain. Yeah. And I would just like people to reflect on that. That was so creepy. Let me just bring yeah. that up. Wait a second. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you spotted that yeah. when you, when yeah, you yeah. put that up. But, yeah. yeah. It's uh, hidden. Yeah. It's veiled. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there's those... another message in this painting. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. See how, how God is in the brain. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see that. And yes. We perceive ourselves. And yeah. then he puts out his finger to man who's just there mm. and puts the energy in man. Mm. So yeah. Oh, you got cut off, Rose, but I'm feeling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can see the outline of the of the brain and the yeah, in the image that was intentional, right? By yes, yes. So yeah. Michelangelo had a lot of thoughts going on when he I didn't know. Is that the real picture? Is that the real picture? Yeah, my friend. Yeah. 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 From the Sistine Chapel. It's yeah. the brain? Yeah, oh, my brain. God. I thought that Matt did that. Oh, I no, I wish. I wish. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Matt, thank you yeah. so much. And anyone who wants to know more or wants any other information, just either contact Tova or myself. Um, yep. Matt, uh, we can relay anything to Matt. And also, totally. you know, you can continue this discussion on on Facebook. And yeah. this program will also go up on YouTube so you can yeah. refer to anyone else that you're looking at this right. area of our lives because it is the most yeah. important area, if, whether we're agnostic, uh, what have you, what's it, um, yeah. all of the different models. Yeah. Yeah. Religious, not ourselves. religious, yes. sure. blue, yeah. white, purple, all the colors of the rainbow. That's it. Exactly. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you, you'll you share these slides. There, was, there are a number of yeah. them in there that give a little bit more detail that people can, you know, look through. Yeah. And then, yeah, feel Wonderful. free to pass on any comments or questions. I'm happy to engage with people more as they're chewing on these things. And. Yeah, fantastic. Gave us a lot of food for thought. Have a wonderful rest mm. of the day, Rose. Oh, enjoy pleasure. your day. Thank we'll you. see you next week. Bye. God bless. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thanks again.